Hey, I'm Daniel, and you're watching an episode of my podcast, The Film Crazy Show, on YouTube. And if I sound weird at all, it is because I am sick, so I would like to just get that out of the way. In this conversation, I was able to speak with writer, director Phil Connell, as well as lead actor Thomas DuPlessis for their film Jump Darling, which is one of Cloris Leachman's final film roles. It's a film that has been making its way through the festival circuit throughout 2021. The film is about Thomas's character, Russell, who is a rookie drag queen who, after a breakup, is reeling. He retreats to the middle of the country, to his grandmother's house, where she is in bad shape but refuses to go to a nursing home. And the grandmother is played by Cloris Leachman. Also, just to let you know, you probably noticed from the episode, but the interview was filmed in March of 2021. And to be honest, my computer crashed earlier this year. I had thought I had lost these interviews forever. I was able to find them recently again. Uh, so I will be posting them throughout now, through now to the end of the year. So I'm excited to actually be posting these interviews. And luckily it's still timely because Jump Darling is playing at New Fest New York through online through October 26th. So that is the Tuesday. And it's also playing at the Virginia Film Festival on October 29th in person. And if you're in Canada, it is, since it's a Canadian film, it is available on, able to stream on Crave TV. It is, and it's also available to rent on the Cineplex store as well as Apple TV in Canada. So, so links to everything I just said will be down below. So excited to be sharing this conversation. I'm glad I found it. So here is Phil to introduce the show. Hi there, I'm Phil Connell, the writer and director of Jump Darling, and you are listening to the Film Craziest Show. Hi, I'm Thomas DePlessy. I play Russell and Fishy Falters in Jump Darling, and you are listening to The Film Crazy Show. Awesome. And I am Daniel, the host of The Film Crazy Show. It's great to have you both here for Jump Darling. Good to be here. Just because this is one of uh, Cloris Leachman's final roles, I figured we would just start with her. What, what was it like casting her, uh, Phil? Great. It was a pretty smooth process. Um, we, we kind of always knew that we wanted to try getting a star in the middle of Margaret um, and thought we maybe had a shot at it because it was a film carrying role for an actor over the age of, you know, kind of 85. And, you know, those opportunities are kind of thin for folks in that age bracket. So we thought maybe we had a shot. And um, we just kind of started papering, you know, reaching out to reaching out to Hollywood agents with a um, small, co- small cohort of actors and, and Cloris was in there and um, Cloris is known to be very indie friendly. And as soon as we connected with her team, there seemed to be an enthusiasm and interest and they connected with the script and uh, that was that. And then it was just a matter of kind of getting her here and getting it all organized. But it was actually a fairly smooth process. It did happen very close to production, so it was a bit last minute. Um, but um, the process was actually, you know, kind of the way you want it to, to go. And, and Thomas, what was it like? You guys, you have like a special connection with her character in the film. What was it like sharing that on-screen chemistry with her? Yeah, um, Cloris made it really, really easy. Once the kind of, you know, the veneer of, you know, I'm going to be working with the Hollywood legend kind of wore off quite quickly, actually, um, you know, it just felt like working with another super professional actor, obviously. Um, she uh, he took the work seriously, but not herself at all. Um, she was always cracking jokes and, you know, keeping, keeping the energy up. And uh, it was such a joy. Right after I met her, I feel like I, I, I felt like I knew her for years. So, um, you know, she was really easy to perform. Okay. Does, does, it, does it kind of feel special, like, when she calls you darling in the film? Yeah, um, I mean, Cloris is so good at what she does. And a lot of the time, you know, you couldn't really differentiate between is Cloris just being Cloris right now or is she, you know, is she playing the role? And so, you know, anytime she would come out with, you know, um, an affectionate term like darling, you felt it. Which she used a lot off screen as well as on screen. She really embraced the word. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, she would definitely say, Good night, darling. Okay, so that's kind of like, okay, is this Cloris or is this Margaret? Okay. I think she was just kind of leaning into it all, you know? Okay, method acting. <laughs> now, um, for you, Phil, uh, 
you you obviously direct the film. Um, what was it like kind of exploring that, directing that dynamic between uh, Russell and Margaret, and then as well as the very different dynamic between Linda Cash's character and Margaret? Um, I mean, it was, uh, it was fairly similar process, um, to be honest. Um, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, you know, it was really just a matter of preparation. I had obviously written the script, so, um, um, and just, you know, spending a ton of time on the casting process and kind of making sure we had the right people for these roles. And I felt really confident that, that we did. We'd offered the role to Linda. We'd done an open call casting process for, um, for Thomas's character, Russell, and, you know, saw all the 150 people for that role. And Cloris was obviously a legend that was also perfect because she kind of had that. Uh, she had dramatic chops, but was also known for comedy, so she could bring levity very you know, naturally into the character. Um, so um, a lot of that work was done for me. So it was really just a matter of, you know, being prepared and knowing the script and kind of having a clear vision of the tone that I wanted. But I was working with such professionals um, that, um, you know, that were really willing to, to, to work with me to kind of get there that, um, it was great. I mean, we had a really magical experience on set. Um, there was a lot of great personal connections and it's three to four and we're shooting a lot of lovely feelings about it that made it a really wonderful working environment and was very blessed with a great team. Yeah, preparation meets luck. <laughs> okay. And did you feel lucky getting her for the film as well? Absolutely. I mean, it was Cloris Leachman. You know, like we had this dream of casting a star for the role of Margaret, but like, you know, it, it was, you know, for a long time it was a dream. There was a lot of people who didn't really believe that it was something we'd be able to do. Um, you know, just because of the size and scale of the production, the fact that it was a debut feature and I didn't have a track record, all these things make it a little more difficult. Um, so when, you know, when her, she and her team agreed, we were, we were overjoyed, you know, we were just overjoyed. And then with the experience being um, as wonderful it was and as wonderful as it was and with her performance, we were so proud of her performance in the film um, that we honestly feel like it was a, a real act of generosity for her to take the risk on this film and to give the performance she gave. So yeah, we're just incredibly grateful for that experience. Okay. And just, just staying on course for, for an, a couple more, um, does it feel like in, in reflection, uh, what's it like having her final, like one of her final big roles, like immortalized in your film? Well, I mean, I, th you know, I mean, obviously that makes, you know, kind of elevates the whole thing even more. Um, you know, we were obviously very saddened to learn that Cloris passed away. We were also, you know, pleased to know that we were able, we did actually share the film with her and had a conversation with her after she saw the film in late September. And so we got to have that experience. Um, but obviously we're, we were sad to not be able to sit with her in a theater and watch it and get to see an audience respond to her performance and have, have her be celebrated um, for that performance, for all that she gave to it. Um, because I just sort of feel like, you know, audiences would, would have really embraced her for that and celebrated her. Um, so I'm sad that she didn't get that, but we're obviously incredibly honored that, you know, this ended up being, you know, kind of um, a big, you know, sort of a bit of a swan song for her. And well, would, would you mind sharing what she thought of it? Yeah, she just said, I mean, she was very sort of like short and sweet about it. She said, I, she said, uh, she said, I loved it. I thought it was great. I look so old. <laughs> you know? I mean, we've had lots of conversations about the script, right? So, um, you know, she was kind of seeing it come to life. What I think was really new to her was all the drag sequences um, that she hadn't seen because we shot all of that separately. Stuff so that would have been, you know, new, new for her. Um, but she's such an ally of the LGBT community. She was on, you know, judge on Drag Race in one of the early seasons. Um, so, you know, that also makes the whole thing more poignant. Poignant that she was like an ally of the community, and that for her to be in this, you know, small Canadian LGBTQ film um, is really cool. Okay, that, that's actually a great transition because I was going to go to the, the fishy falters part of the conversation next. Um, I'm just curious, how did you guys come up with that alter ego? Was that always what she looked like? 
Uh, it was sort of, uh, you mean like like how the character appears literally, like the sort of the character design? Yeah. Yeah, uh, so that was, um, you know, certain things were scripted. Um, you know, there's a lot of information that I had written in the script in terms of kind of the vibe of the different scenes. Um, and uh, so that was kind of a blueprint. And from there, it was like a real collaboration between Thomas and then um, certainly our costume designer and the hair and makeup person. Um, and obviously the choice of wigs, all the wigs actually belong to Tainomi Banks, who's one of the drag queens in the film, but she actually lent us her collection of wigs to choose from for Fishy. Um, so there was kind of a collaboration on putting, shaping kind of the looks, um, you know, over the course of the film. And then obviously how the character was brought to life was all about Thomas. So the choreography, um, he did, you know, his own, his own choreography, which was very much something that we wanted we wanted it to feel really authentic like an artist finding their own voice um so it was kind of those three things that came together and just having a team that kind of like supported that vision and you know helped help kind of put it together okay well, what was it like doing the choreography for you thomas oh it was a ton of fun um you know i Bill wanted all the choreography, most of it, to come from me. And so doing the choreography felt uh, really organic and obviously, and uh, it was just kind of, you know, me living out my drag fantasy. And it was always something that um, I had wanted to try on a certain level. I've been going to drag shows for the last, you know, since I've lived in Toronto for about 12 years. I have so many friends who do it professionally. And um, so it was really just that permission to kind of, you know, go off and, and uh, you know, kind of do whatever I wanted with it. So uh, it, was, it was a ton of fun. I love the way you put it, permission to go off. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, exactly what it was. Did, did you guys try out the character at like local like um, drag nights kind of thing? No, no, we never did that. We, we had rehearsals. Good idea, <laughs> Um, with a couple of the queens um, leading up to leading up to shooting, and, you know, and they would give me kind of like pointers um, here and there um, in terms of kind of like how to refine certain moments of, of the choreography and whatnot. Both of us were familiar enough with the drag scene that we could, you know, we could really talk about various reference points and our experience and stuff. But you know. Going out as fishy filters might have been an interesting idea had we had the time for it. Make it as make it like a featurette, you know. <laughs> yeah. You also have Tanomi Banks facelift and Miss Fierce Delicious for the film. Um, Toronto Drag Royalty. Did they work as like consultants kind of thing as well? Uh, yes, um, in a way. So I, I I knew Faye and Tanomi. I've known them over the years. And so when I was developing the script, I actually did spend quite a time with both of them as well as other queens, um, just in terms of developing the story and, and, and getting their points of view and putting their points of view into the story. So like, for example, uh, the big uh, scene that Facelift has as Harry Longshlong with uh, Thomas and Fishy at the end of the dressing room, a lot of that narrative in that scene comes from her personal story and experiences as a queen. Um, so yeah, um, we didn't call them consultants, but yeah, that was, they were definitely a part of it. And like Thomas said, just in the rehearsal process as well, as, you know, being a part of it. And, you know, they as well came up with their own routines for the, for the songs that they performed in the film. So yeah, certainly very much part of the kind of collaboration. Okay. Well, what was it like watching, what was it like for you guys watching them perform? Well, I mean, we've been used to watching them perform on the strip. Uh, so we had, Experience that the only difference is that this time we were kind of working and shooting at the same time. So um, uh, it was less relaxed than a normal experience of watching them perform, I would say, but, but also incredibly awesome to see these queens being a part of this film and being a part of it, you know, as creative collaborators and participants. Amazing. Okay. Now it's definitely a different dynamic for, dynamic for you, Thomas. Like, um, what, what did they think of your performances? Uh, I, I think they liked it. Um, Tainomi has always been quite complimentary of it. Um, even from when we were rehearsing it before we even went to camera to, um, you know, to being on set to when she actually finally saw the film. Um, 
she's always throwing me some compliments. So, I mean, if, she, if Tanomi Banks thinks it's all right, then I feel good about it. Now, I, I think my favorite um, performance of yours in this, Thomas, was for Indestructible, just when you're in the bar alone, finding your own uh, character, I guess. Um, you, did you have a favorite performance of your own? Probably that, actually. That's also my favorite one. Um, the, uh, the first one that I do in the film, I, that was, I actually choreographed that for one of the auditions. And then uh, really, you know, we knew that the, the Robin number had to be this like massively cathartic kind of uh, moment for Russell. And um, we worked really hard on that one. And, you know, it, it was one day after rehearsals where we were really kind of like nitpicking and trying things out and certain things weren't working. And it was like hours of the studio. And then Phil was kind of like, do you want to just like come back to the apartment, have a few drinks, like relax, and then try it out that way. And I was like, okay, cool. So we came back here, had a few drinks, moved the dining room table out of the, out of the way, put the music on and just kind of like, you know, I just... I, I left my ego at the door and just kind of like did whatever my body wanted. And um, we're like, oh, there it is. And so then we tried to take that on to stuff. Yeah, it's kind of like, it was kind of like creating a little catalog of, of moves that we could like pull from. For the choreography, was like a lot of it planned? Or, or I don't, sorry if you've talked about this already, but was it like a lot of it planned or was, did you just feel it in the moment? Yeah, a lot of it, it, it was, it was all choreographed. The, the first one, like I said, was choreographed back when I was uh, in the audition process for uh, Swirl, that number. And then the last number high school confidential, uh, that was really highly choreographed during rehearsals uh, before we went to camera. And Robin was probably the one that I had a structure for it. I knew that I wanted it to um, like crescendo. Uh, and I knew what moves were there, but I didn't necessarily have them all in order. And so we did a lot of different takes and I was kind of putting things in, moving things around in, in, in different orders. That was probably the most uh, yeah, three, kind of three, three, in, improv number of the three. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say, like High School Confidential, I think that's the one that involves other people the most. So I guess that would be a little less freeform. Yeah, of course. Okay. I love the way you guys like talk about it though. Just for someone like me who isn't really, who has never seen an episode of RuPaul's Drag Race, I just, I, I like, um, I like learning about it and just you guys, uh, I guess, shedding light on this culture. I think that's interesting. Get into it. It's a great show. Just like the pieces <laughs> to catch, catch up on. Thirteen. Yeah, it's it's kind of ridiculous at this point, but highly entertaining. Okay, I I, I think I've actually I think I've seen a fin, like a bit of a finale episode. I, I I couldn't tell you their names, but or which season it was. But do that once you do that, and then the pandemic lifts, you actually come down to a drag bar and see how it looks on the script, which is a different thing as well. So like, which is a bit more what the movie the lens of the movie is, whereas Big Paul's is much more uh, big production, glossy, bubblegum kind of you know, really uh, high production, less, less kind of rough and tumble than it is on the strip. Okay, and, and that's the Toronto strip, right? Yes. Well, I mean, okay. you can do the New York one, you can do the LA one, you can do lots of different cities, but yes, and that's my point of view. Okay, and how, how, how big is the drag scene in Toronto or the, the strip per se? Well, the drag scene is pretty big. Uh, I mean, you have, you have um, several drag bars that you know you can go there on any night of the week and, and you will see performances you, you, you might see one you know you probably see one emceeing queen throughout the night and then a bunch of other sort of uh queens that perform throughout the night and you can do that pretty much any night of the week, uh, any night of the week. Um, and then in addition to that you have all sorts of um sort of bespoke things happening you know different events across the city at different times i mean i don't know how big the Toronto drag community is population wise, but I mean, well, probably got to have, you know, somewhere between 20 and 30 decently well known branded queens. And then you have lots of people, you know, getting into it um, at various stages. You know, there's a huge world out there uh, of queens. You know, 
always was. It's just kind of really kind of come into mainstream consciousness. Okay. And then, awesome. oops, sorry, what did you say, Phil? And it's really come into mainstream consciousness in a big way in the last kind of five to 10 years, largely as a result of RuPaul's drag race. Okay. Okay. And are you hoping with your film, you guys will just get more people on board? You mean to watch it? <laughs> to watch the film and to watch, get into the drag scene or? I mean, sure. I mean, I, you know, I, I suspect that our impact on, you know, drawing people into the world of drag, uh, I think there's lots more effective vehicles than our movie that do that largely, you know, falls and just the queens performing every night in cities around the world. Um, they're doing that work. I mean, we're just telling a small story that happens to all the time. I just hope we get a chance to see it and enjoy it. But uh, I'm certainly not going to have to make any statements about, uh, you know, any potential cultural impact it would have. Also, I, I, I just want to say I appreciated how um, Canadian this movie felt, just because I know, like, I've seen a couple of that a couple of just pure Canadian movies that try to Americanize or like America money, but I just appreciated all the references to like Loyalist College and just Ontario in general. Thank you. Yeah. Was, was that important for you in the writing it? Well, I mean, I, I, at some point along the way, I just decided to situate it in Prince Edward County because that was my experience with my grandmother. She bought a property there and I've been going there for 20 years. And uh, I just, you know, always was used to visiting here in a small town, so just what I know. So as a lens on the story, it made sense. And then I happened to actually, because I've been visiting that place, you know, over the last 20 years, um, I was familiar with it. So I was able to kind of, again, feature it, you know, through my own lens and point of view, you know, and show the things that I know and see and, and like and love when I'm there. So, um, yeah, it was, it was important for me to do that and try to do it, you know, authentically through my own lens. Okay. And, and with, with that being kind of a personal story for you, did you, did you bring any of, like, aspects of your own grandmother into Cloris's character? Oh, big time. Yeah, absolutely. You know, huge, huge inspiration for the writing of Margaret Cloris's character was, was my grandmother. I mean, ultimately, the, the character that, Mar uh, that Cloris brought to life is a different character than than uh, is a different person than my grandmother. But yeah, in, in crafting the script, she was a huge inspiration and huge aspects of the life were inspiration of the story as well. Did did you guys get to have much say in the in the songs that were in the film? Yes, very much. So. I mean, um, so I, the, you know, it's a it's a long story, but we started working on the music well before I started working as a music supervisor on the music probably several years before I even had my producers in place because I just knew how demanding um, the soundtrack was going to be because it was a drag film and we needed recognizable songs from, from name artists and, and to do that on a, on a low budget movie, we needed, to, if we didn't have money, we needed time, you know, to, to, to find the artists who were willing to agree to, um, and publishers who would let their music be in the film for, for less than market rates. So that just was, it was a lot of work and a lot of time and with my wonderful music supervisor, Justin Leslie, out of Tattoo Sound in Toronto. Um, we just worked very, very hard on sketching that out. But yeah, absolutely. There was, it was, we were, you know, there was no song that made it in, but I, you know, I needed, you know, I was very much <clears throat> kind of leading that effort with her support. Okay. Was, was there any song that you would have just your dream song to have in it, but it was just kind of out of reach? Um, I mean, there were lots of amazing songs that came up along the way. I, honestly, the dream song, uh, the dream song was, uh, uh, was Robin Indestructible for that particular performance. Once I kind of like tuned into the idea that that song would really work narratively um, and within the arc of the story and the, the sort of treatment of the story, once I was like, oh, that would be perfectly there. That became like the like, can we get it? Can we get it? Can we get it? And uh, you know, we had to write, had to write a personal letter to Rob, and I had to do that for a lot of the artists. But she approves all of her own uses, um, so I had to really pitch that. Um, and fortunately, she did. So, yeah, that was that was a dream, and um, we got it. But I mean, all, so many of the songs in there, I'm just like over the moon about it. Like just you know, there really aren't. Um, I wouldn't consider there to be any compromises at all. Ultimately, you know, 
know, when we had to compromise, we just went and found something else to get excited about. Okay, awesome. Now, just ending it on this one question and just bringing it back to Cloris Leachman was just over her seven decades in the industry. Did 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 you have a big takeaway from working with her? Either or. Um, yeah. Uh, she. Um, I mean, she really, really kind of embodied what it means to like play on a set and be and like uh, really inject spontaneity um, into the work. And uh, you know, she she really taught me how to. I've said it lots, but she really taught me how to be in the moment on set. You just kind of jumped on that train and she forced you to be a better actor. I would hear that a lot and I never really understood what actors meant by that working with some of the greats. But I think what it means is that, you know, she's so present and she's so in the moment that she kind of, she forces you into that moment with her and then you have no choice but to ride it. Uh, and so that volley, uh, I learned a lot from her. Okay, did you have anything to add to that, Phil? I, I mean, that's mostly, she just, she loved, she loved it. She loved work and that was very clear. And she brought, brought her a lot of joy to work and act on a set. And, you know, um, to see someone at that advanced age still getting that much joy out of her work was, was really, really special to see, you know, and kind of very inspiring. So, you know, we can all kind of aspire to, to have that much passion for what we do that stage of our life. Did you have a favorite performance of hers from her career? Oh, God. Uh, or just maybe a couple? <laughs> That's loaded, I'm sorry. Uh, I, mean, she, I mean, she's just, there, there's so many. Um, you know, it's really, really hard. Uh, this isn't really an answer to your question, but when we were, when we were doing her hair, and her hair before she got to set, we were talking about, you know, when we first knew of Cloris Leachman. And I said the first time I became aware of her as an actor was um, when she was in The Facts of Life. So The Facts of Life was a system that I grew up on in the 80s. And I remember her and Dinah said, oh, not a good one. <laughs> <laughs> that was not one of, one of the things that she was most proud of. Um, so that's kind of my funny story. It's hard for me to say, but... Yeah, I mean, I would say... Um, I mean, it's kind of cliche, but I mean, like Phyllis and Mary Tyler Moore show, I mean, she's iconic. And then I grew up seeing her mostly as, um, as the grandmother in uh, Malcolm and Miller. So it's, yeah, that one. That was her. Oh, I forgot. Depending on what generation you are, you have a different reference point for when you came to her. Yeah. Okay. Now that you mentioned, just to add on to my experience, uh, now that you mentioned Malcolm in the Middle, that was probably my first one with her. But I first one I really remember was uh, her as the kind of freaky grandmother in Beer Fest. In Beer Fest, oh my, my that's gosh, my brother's. Yeah. I mean, she's yeah. also in Bad Santa. She's very funny. She's in Spanglish. She's very funny. Um, and then you have to see her Oscar money performance in um, the Last Picture Show. Oh, which one? Sorry. It's called the Last Picture Show, and that's the film for which she won the Oscar. Like Okay, okay. I, I will add that to the to the watch list because I have not seen that one. Yeah, it's like an iconic American film. So, director, writer, producer Phil Connell for Jump Darling and Thomas Duplessis as Russell and uh, Fishy Falters uh, in Jump Darling. Thank you guys for chatting with me on the Film Crazy Show. Thanks, Thanks so much. for having us.